temptation back there, so you don't have to be back there every week. Uh, we do require a background check uh, to protect our kids, so um, just know that up front, and um, we would love to have you uh, be part of that. You don't have to be back there by yourself, at least not right away. We would have somebody work with you and help train you for that, so uh, see myself or my lovely wife up here, and uh, we'd be happy to get you plugged in back there and, and uh, bless, be a blessing to our kids, but here's what happens. It be, they become a blessing to you, and uh, so... All right, we are, uh, we're live on Facebook now, so let me welcome those that are just joining us on Facebook. Welcome you to Life Church here in Humansville. Thank you for joining us. Like, comment, and share the video so that uh, you can help be a part of sending the gospel around the world. You can also give to this ministry at givetolifechurch.com. All right, you're looking at me. Am I forgetting something? Okay. We have a little bit of a, of a sign language, and uh, sometimes I can't read it, so... Uh, apparently, apparently, I liked that one song during worship really good that I picked two different versions and played the same song. Um, but I, I didn't catch it when I was putting it together, but I did catch it when it started playing again. So uh, anyway, thank you for uh, loving me and being gracious and, and uh, just moving with the Spirit as he, uh, as he leads us. We are thrilled to have Greg and Rochelle Colgrove with us today. Uh, they're from Iowa. Are you all Iowa originally? Yeah. She, you're Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, don't hold that against him. He pastored in Iowa, and uh, and now they live in the uh, Springfield area. And uh, we count it a joy and a privilege to be their friends, and uh, are thankful for their ministry. Come and share what God has put on your heart, and uh, we look forward to hearing it. Thank you, my God bless friend. you, man. Man, thank you, thank you. I see what a treat it is to get to be here. I have to tell you this straight up that uh, as soon as we are done here today, Rochelle and I are starting a, a anniversary trip out to the upper northwest. We're going to like go and uh, see mountains and see scenery and things that nobody else gets to see. And uh, we're going to do that up in the state of Washington, the North Cascade Mountains. Yes, uh, that's what we get for 35 years of uh, marital bliss. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, pretty good. So uh, I'm excited about that, but I, I'm, I'm excited about being here. I, I want to always start this out uh, wherever I am uh, in just saying that we appreciate your pastor and uh, Pastor Carl and Margo. You guys are heroes to us in so many ways. I tell your story uh, lots of places. As we were pulling up, I was thinking uh, about the song, uh, 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 The Dry Bones, The Dry Bones Rattling. And I think about that this church was that dry bones just about five years ago. And then uh, an infusion kind of got uh, put into here. I'd say it was an infusion of the Holy Spirit, uh, God's grace and his favor on you, sending you Pastor Carl and, uh, and some life. And I like the name of the church, Life Church. Uh, the fact that there is life in this building and life in this community uh, that reflects the, the goodness of God, I, I just applaud uh, all the things that you are doing in reaching people and loving people. And I just want to say thank you. You have a great, I, I would love for us to just give them a hand today and say thank you so much. And Pastor Carl, I'll say this, just in the little bit I've been here again, because it's been a couple of years since I've been here, but uh, just a little bit I've been here again, you're blessed with some incredible people. And uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a very good combination. You got a good pastor and you got good people. So, uh, so you're, you're blessed both ways. So, uh, hey, it's a privilege to get to represent Convoy of Hope slash Rural Compassion. Uh, just a little, you, you guys see what we do all the time because we usually do it through you. That's how this works. We usually do it through you. Uh, I saw that uh, we, we just made a big deal that it was 10 years ago. Convoy got this humongous um, uh, wake-up call, I guess you'd say, with the, uh, it was a Joplin tornadoes that took place 10 years ago and uh, put Convoy of Hope not only on the proverbial map, but it really helped us to solidify some things and uh, helped us to be a, an organization that kind of got to, had to put our ducks in order and uh, not only on our disaster services side, but then when COVID hit last year, 
uh, we kind of had to reorganize and re, uh, reprogram a little bit because we'd never seen anything like that. Churches had to do the, the same thing. And, um, and last year, about this time, Hal Donaldson shot this out to our entire organization that our new goal in disaster services, whether it's working in rural communities, working in major metropolises, there are people out in America who are all of a sudden don't have jobs, uh, struggling financially. It is, uh, it is our new goal to feed 10 million meals right here in the United States, not somewhere across, so it's, but right Right here in the United States. Uh, I am glad to tell you that we not only reached that goal of 10 million, but as of to date, we have serviced over 200 million meals in America. And we have used, we have used you. I mean, you guys, the, the truck shows up, the fact that you sent out a bunch of, I don't know that whether that was through us or who that was through, but uh, the fact that you guys have uh, are doing that, uh, you're, you're part of those numbers. So we are grateful for everything God does. Uh, last year alone, our Rural Compassion Team uh, in our rural, Amer in rural, com uh, rural America, we saw 350 semi trucks go out into rural America. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then we, um, uh, this is another cool aspect of something that I, uh, that I get to do this uh, because I'm a United States missionary. Um, we get to kind of make up some things as we go. And one of our makeup things that we have done is my wife is a marriage therapist. Rochelle is over here, and she is an amazing, uh, just an amazing gal. She helps people keep their marriages together uh, day in, day out, and helps them not only to just uh, kind of have a, uh, uh, just to survive, because we don't believe that marriage should just be till like death do you part. Yay, it's over. It's not an endurance race. It's it's it should be something that's enjoyable. And uh, so we get we have had the opportunity to invest a lot in people's marriages over these last, uh, first four or five months of the year. Uh, already, Rochelle and I have had over 200 couples come to our thing called Fun Marriage Workshop, where we help people have uh, good marriages, give them some tools and stuff. And uh, we're excited about getting to do that, and we're just keep on expanding in all of that. So that's part of what, when you support us on a monthly basis, that's what your finances are going towards, to help people not only have food, but also to help people have better marriages, and better marriages help us have a better America. I just believe that. I've said this a time or two, but if I was the devil and I wanted to destroy a church, a nation, if I wanted to destroy a school system, I would honestly start with the home. That's where I'd start. Because uh, that home is, uh, I mean, is, uh, is where things happen and lives are built and uh, what happens at home matters. And that big part of that, of course, is marriage. This morning, I'm going to expound, uh, expand on that with this message called Owning It. Uh, that's the name of our message is Own It. Uh, um, I, look out in, uh, I look out into a society today. And um, you can look on the news and whether it's uh, riots in anywhere in America or whether it's what's going on in Capitol Hill, uh, whether it's happening uh, here, there, or anywhere else. What I see a lot today is nobody wants to step up and say, I own it. Uh, we want to blame a lot of different people for the way that our system is, the way that we're treated, and all those things. And this morning, this morning I want to talk about personal responsibility and us taking personal responsibility. I'm going to have us uh, start in the Word, and before you put the verses up, uh, as, I, as I look through God's Word today, um, there are several people that I, I look at, and it got off uh, that, that, that uh, people in the Bible that you see that blamed other things. It started right at the beginning, right in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve. God confronts them after they partook of a forbidden fruit, of a, something that God said, don't do. The devil comes beside, Satan comes beside and said, did God really say that? 
and tempted them, and they fell for that temptation. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, there's a little uh, 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 dialogue that takes place between God and Adam and Eve. And in those particular verses, uh, Eve said it was, or Adam said, it was a woman that you gave me. She made me do it. <laughs> do you know why God created a woman last? Because he didn't want advice on how to make everything else, right? Uh, so uh, just a just a thought. That was anointed. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that was the other reason. So... Uh, uh, and then you got Eve that said, no, it wasn't. It was, it was the devil that made me do it, right? Uh, so right from the beginning. Then you go one chapter later to chapter 4, and uh, verses 8 through 13 again. You got another dialogue where Cain has killed his brother. And he blames and said, God, if you had accepted, and, and blames God. What's interesting is all the different people that we have opportunity to blame in our life. We can blame our mom and our dad. How many of you know there's enough blame to go to mom and dad to last, right? Uh, we've told our kids, Rochelle told our youngest son and our oldest son, look, we mess up as parents. We will pay for your therapy later on, however it was it that we messed you up, right? We'll just pay for that. We didn't do it on purpose, but uh, we, 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 we can't. Uh, uh, anyway. Um, and then you go through more of the Bible, and you finally come to a cha uh, uh, some chapters in the Bible where there's a guy that stands up and says, I, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm owning what life has given me. His name is uh, Joseph. In chapters 37 through 50, what's interesting is he has some uh, he has some revel or he has some dreams and he ends up in prison and you know his story. It was in prison that he could have sat back and said, "Woe is me, self pity," and maybe he did all that. Scripture doesn't record it, but what you do find is that uh, God saw. Joseph, while he was, whether underneath Potiphar or whether he was in prison, both places, he saw him and God blessed Joseph. And whatever he touched, the Lord blessed him and showed him favor. So much so that at the very end of that story, he's now second in command of an entire country. People are coming to him, and God has honored him because he didn't blame people. And at the end of that whole chapter, chapter uh, or of the book of, uh, of uh, Genesis, chapter 50, I believe it's verse 17, uh, his brothers say, hey, remember us. And, and don't, have, uh, don't, don't take out anything on us. Uh, remember what dad said, because Jacob, his dad, has already passed away. And, and uh, Joseph said, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. He just owned his stuff. I want to take you to a portion of scripture, though, where there's a guy. Uh, if there's two people that you could compare real easy to, it's the life of Saul and the life of David. Because, in, especially in this realm, because in, uh, uh, Saul was one of those guys, he didn't want to own anything. He found blame with everybody. And the problem was is that he lost everything because he never raised his hand and said, I did that. Never did that. David, on the other hand, when he was confronted, he said, I'm the man. I am it. And what's interesting is David is uh, later on known as a man. He did some horrific things. He did some terrible things. Had an adulterous affair going. He killed somebody. Uh, how many of you know that would land us in jail for a while, some of those, the, the killing part, right? And, uh, and, but, but when he was confronted, he said, that was me. I, he owns it. But I want to turn uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verses, and, and I, I have up here verses, uh, I think I had you start at chapter, or verse 9 through 23. Let me just, uh, I'm just going to give you a few verses just to give you a little background to what we're going to read. First Samuel chapter 15, and it starts in verse 3. Uh, this is Saul, or Samuel, the prophet, who gives Saul these commands. And he says this, go back, uh, go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, 
uh, cattle and sheep, camels and donkey. Destroy, that is the command, okay? And then you get to verse 9. So they, uh, the, and leading up to that, so they destroy the Amalekites and, uh, and, and he was on, he, uh, he assembled about 200,000 people and uh, they went and destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 9, but Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything that was good. What was the command again? Destroy it all. Was Saul obedient? He was not. Uh, everything, it was good. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret, let me read what's up here. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was so angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Was he being honest? No. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What's this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, the soldiers brought them. Did you hear that? The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Did he blame somebody already? You see the blame. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Oh, tell me, Samuel, uh, Saul said. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Now here's where the excuses start to take place. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers... They were the ones that took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder and the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. You see, he just started to reason. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than than the fat of rams. Let's say that first. Uh, oh, yeah, go to the next one. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Wow. I want to give you three laws of responsibility this morning. I've got about three things Honestly, these are like three things that have captured my heart. I, I want you to know this, that I grew up uh, as a, a kind of in a victim mentality. I was the son of an alcoholic, grew up in an al alcoholic home. My dad was actually, I was 16 years old when my dad died in a one-car accident drunk driving. I was saved in a little Assembly of God church at the age of 12 years old. So four years prior to my dad dying. And I started this whole journey of trying to follow God in an alcoholic home. To be honest, I remember speakers coming to our church and saying, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And going home saying, I've, I've, I can't do anything. I struggled with uh, self-pity. Uh, self, uh, 
a lot. I, God, why did you put me in this home? God, why did you make me this way? God, and and uh, very, I mean, I just blame God for a lot of things. I blame my dad for this. I blame my mom for that. Grew up in a very poor environment. And I'll never forget the one, the, 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 one of the things that helped me more than anything was uh, people who came beside me and said, uh, you, you, God's going to use you. God can do all things. See, and when I started to believe, instead of believing uh, the, the things of this world and blaming uh, everything around me, my life changed and I, I became a person that was empowered rather than a victim. And I hope and pray this morning that whatever background you are from, that you grab a hold of this and you say, it is time to be empowered. I am not a victim. I'd like for you to turn to your neighbor right now. I'd like for you to say, I am not a victim. I'd love for you to turn to your neighbor and say, I am a child of God. That alone empowers you because you are a child of promise. You are a child of hope. You are a child of destiny. You are not a child of a victim mentality. You are not that person. It is time to rise up and be that person that God has empowered you to be. So here are three laws of responsibility. I'm going to give you it, and as soon as I say it, you can either write it down, but I think you can remember it. I'm going to give it to you, and then uh, we're going to look at our neighbor and say this very same thing to our neighbor. Number one law is I am responsible for my own thoughts, actions, uh, my own thoughts, feelings, actions, and beliefs. I'll say it one more time so that you get this. I am responsible for my own Thoughts, feelings, actions, and beliefs. Okay, I would like for you to, each one of you, take a turn to, and say that to, to your neighbor. Some of you are going, ah, that's kind of scary, right? I got to be responsible. Number two, and you're going to like this one even better. I am not responsible for your thoughts, feelings, actions, or beliefs. All right? I'd like for you to say that to somebody. Woo! How did that feel to somebody? Was that freeing? Pastor, how'd that feel? <laughs> free, free. I'm free at last. Uh, and number three law is uh, we influence each other's thoughts, feelings, actions, and beliefs. We do influence, but we're not responsible, okay? We are not responsible for our neighbor's thoughts, feelings, actions, or beliefs. I am responsible for my own thoughts, actions, feelings, or beliefs. I'm going to come back to that thought in just a little bit. Two other things that I'd like to just share. Uh, one I have uh, uh, up on the board is this. We used to tell our kids this all the time. You can choose your actions or your consequences, but nobody gets to choose both. Okay? When I look out in society today, what I am seeing is people who want both. They want to get to choose their actions and somebody erase all their consequences or, let's, or blame somebody for everything that's happening in their life. So let me just go through this one more time. You can choose your actions or you can choose your consequences. If you choose your actions, there's consequences that come with those actions. The Bible says this, whatever a man sows, he will reap. If you sow good seed, you'll reap good results. If you sow weeds, you reap bad results, right? Or you can choose your consequences. If you start out in your life and say, this is where I want to go. This is the consequences, good or bad, that I want for my life. You have to alter 
your actions to get those consequences. Do you get that? Good or bad, you get that. Nobody gets to choose both. But what we see in our society today is people who want to choose both. The last piece of, of uh, this is just my own little revelation I had years ago. I've never heard anybody preach this, uh, so it must be like my own, uh, which is kind of cool. I'm, I should write a book about this and make millions. I am convinced today that you're, you, in this, in this room today, and if you're listening, you're either in pursuit of one of these two things in your life. You're either in pursuit of the truth or you're in pursuit of a lifestyle. If you're in pursuit of God's truth, you alter your lifestyle to meet that truth. If you're in pursuit of a lifestyle, you will gather around you people who want to say what your itching ears want to say. Right? Want to hear. That's what you will be around. You're either in pursuit of a lifestyle or you're in pursuit of the truth. And God help us today, please. How many of you love God and you love his word? What his word says trumps whatever society says. Come on. Whatever society says God's word trumps. God's word is truth, and you can bank on it that it is going to be true for you. So let me go through then, what are we to own? What then are we to own? I, I just wrote down six or seven things. I, I could have made a bigger list than this, but this one will suffice for us today. Number one, you are to own your own soul. When you stand before God, you're not going to stand before God and be able to blame anybody else around us. Did I miss? Oh, anybody else around us. The Bible says this, that it is appointed unto man once to die in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. After that comes his judgment. Uh, this is the way it actually is. All of us are going to uh, are going to spend eternity somewhere, right? Heaven or hell. When we die, we will stand before God Almighty, and we will be judged at that moment. And here's the good news: you and I, at this point, we get to choose where we're going to spend eternity, because you are responsible for your own soul. Years ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I can tell you this, it was the greatest decision I ever made in my entire life. How many would say that was the greatest decision of your life? That, it, that you've made some, I mean, how many of you would say, yeah, I've made some bad choices in my life, but, but that one, that one I got it right. It's interesting because we, we, uh, if you were to go outside of this building today and ask people uh, living their own lifestyle to, to evaluate your decision to follow Christ, they would say, you guys are crazy. You guys are the crazy people. May I assure you that you are not crazy? The day you gave your life to Christ was the first day of your sanity. Come on. That was the first day of your sanity. I know this, that when I asked Jesus into my life, life took on the, uh, before Christ, it was little L, and death was a big D, staring me in the face. But after I asked Jesus Christ into my life, life became a great big L, and I started living because I had a, a vision and I had, I had the assurance that when I was done, I was going to spend eternity in, in heaven, and death took on a little D. It still kind of freaks me out. Come on. Does death kind of freak you out just a little bit? I mean, now, 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 I should say it this way. Dying freaks me out. Death doesn't freak me out as much. But just how you're going to get there. Yeah, it does, uh, that, I don't want to think about that, right? Uh, so, but, uh, but we get to own our own life, and, or our own soul. And the Bible tells us this, that there's only one way to get to heaven. Only one. And that's through the life and death of Jesus Christ. That when I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, 
I know that from at that very moment, the Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, says uh, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord uh, and believe in your heart, you will be saved. The moment I did that, I asked Jesus, you have to take, an, uh, you, you, you have to own your own soul. No one will be, no, if you spend eternity in hell, there will be no one else to blame. That's the scary part. Number two is you need to take, uh, you need to own your own possessions. I actually saw this from Margo on her Facebook page. I've preached this message like a few times, and I've actually cited you on this one. Poverty is no excuse for filth. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Do you remember putting that down there? That was a pretty good like statement. Uh, poverty is no excuse for faith. There are two commandments that deal with our possessions. Thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet. What's interesting is how often we want to look at other people and go, man, I wish I had their stuff. I wish I had their car. Wish I had their house. Wish I had their bankroll. I wish I had their uh, retirement account. I wish I had their whatever it might be. Lord, help us. Amen. May I say this, that today if you drive around a, an old jalopy vehicle, take care of that thing like it is the greatest thing in the world. Come on. If you live in a little, uh, little, uh, uh, little trailer, take care of that thing like you own it. Poverty is no excuse for filthiness. If you want God to bless you with more, why would he bless you with more if you don't take care of what you already have? All right. Number three, we need to own our job. Own our job. I, uh, I, I, I just heard this really cool testimony of a, of a person who owned not only his job, he, he kind of just owned where he was that day. He was a guy that went in uh, uh, for an interview, and it was a pretty high-stake interview, uh, like an incredible job that he'd been praying for. Uh, it was uh, He, he kind of went into it going, God, if you open up this door, that would be great. Otherwise, God, I'm going to be content with what you've given me, where I am. I'm going to be fully where I am instead of wishing I was somewhere else. I'm going to be right here. Well, when he went in to, to, to get to this, for this interview, he actually, um, I had to go to the restroom first. He went in there, and there was a guy or two, and there were like uh, paper towels here, there, and everywhere, all over the floor. And uh, he went in, washed, did his, and then washed his hands, and then picked up all the stuff around it and threw it in the garbage. He went into his interview, and he didn't do it like thinking, uh, wow, this place is a pit. wasn't anything like that. It was just like, stuff needs is there. I need to pick it up, and I know that I'm, it's not my job, but hey, and he threw it away. Went to the interview, and the, the, he, he ended up getting the job. And the, the, the boss caught him like two days later and said, um, you're probably wondering why I chose you over all the other people that we interviewed. He goes, well, uh, yeah, I mean, there were other people more qualified. He said, I was actually one of the guys in that restroom that day watching what that, and everybody else walked by those uh, things. You, you had the mentality to pick that up. And if you're the guy who will pay attention to those details, you're the guy I want hired for this job. He didn't blame other people. He just said, my, I get to, this is where I am. Own where you are. Own your job. Quit wishing you were somewhere else. I love this little statement, and you can put it up there. Beware of destination addiction. A preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place, the next job, or with the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. That is a great statement. I want to, I'll read that again. Beware of destination addiction. Oh, if I could just get another wife, if I could have a different house, if I could be, be fully where you are. The preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place, the next job, or with the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. Number four, I want to encourage you to own your church. 
Humansville Life Church is a great church. You want to know why? Because you go here. This is not a great church because Pastor Carl's the pastor here, though that, ad that adds to it. This is a great church because you go here. I'm going to ask you this question, who is the church? And after I ask that question again, I want you to reply with, I am the church. Ready? Who is the church? I am the church. Look at your neighbor and say, who is the church? Do you want to know why this is a great church? It's because you go here. Uh, whether you like, did you, I'm on video. I'm right there, right? Um, I'm even bigger than you thought. Uh, uh, so, uh, where was I? You, you messed with me. My wife does this to me a lot. I'll be right in the middle of the con I'm blaming her right now. Uh, <laughs> you see how easy this is to blame people, right? Who is the church? I love this little example. You may not like it or you may like it, but uh, uh, the, the, the New England Patriots for a while had a quarterback, and his name was Tom Brady. Tom Brady's Bradyed a lot of people, including the Chiefs, once or twice, which I'm not bringing up. I will not bring that up in this service. Uh, but what's interesting about Tom Brady, like him or not, uh, he would, they were asked one time, what makes it your organization a winning organization? And what they actually found out was uh, that they had this little uh, rule, the 15-foot rule, that if you uh, were a member of the Patriots, and it didn't matter whether it was your job or not, but if you were a member of the, and you saw something that needed to be done, and you were within 15 feet of it, <clears throat> it was your job to do it. If there was a paper on the floor that missed the garbage and you're, you see it, it's your, it was all about paying attention to detail. When you walk into this church building and you say, somebody should pick that up, guess who that somebody is? You, you, right? You know why? Because why? Because I am the church, right? If you see a ministry that needs to be done or somebody, uh, somebody needs something done, whose job is that? I am the church. As the church member, this is a great church. Not because of that person. That, this is a great church because you go here. Own your church. Own it. Number five, if you're going to be really good at owning something, uh, I suggest that you own also your health. Own your health. My wife just went through a... Um, uh, about, and I want to say thank you as a church for praying for my wife. If, in fact, you did, uh, my, my wife uh, just had breast cancer. It was last August that she went in for a mammogram, and early, uh, late uh, August, they found out that there was uh, some concern. Uh, she ended up, because of some connections that we had, and people we knew, uh, she actually got in really quickly to have it taken care of down in Houston, Texas at Baylor University, one of the top places in all of the United States, uh, where she, she had a double mastectomy. And I'll tell you that the night that, uh, that this whole thing started, when she, she got the, the, the news that she, uh, that she had tested positive for breast cancer, uh, we had all kinds of stuff kind of floating through our mind. We walked the journey with Rochelle's mom 24 years ago where she lost her life because of breast cancer. Every year Rochelle had a mammogram. It was kind of like, well, is this going to be the year? And we did stuff to try and take care of our health and pre, pre, you know, uh, take care of stuff. But, uh, but this just kind of came on. And um, that night of uh, when we found that out, we cried ourselves to sleep. I, I remember holding Rochelle in my arms and she just wept and I tried to be strong. It's gonna be okay. We don't know what the end's gonna look like and stuff. And um, she finally fell asleep. And then I walked into the, I, I couldn't fall asleep. So I went to the other room and um, that night for probably an hour and a half, I just had floods of thoughts in my mind, all of them negative. This is going to be the end. And I started, I, I mean, I'm having flashbacks. 
of, of everything I've ever done with Rochelle from, <clears throat> from the day I proposed to her, met her. I mean, I had flashbacks of our wedding day and flashbacks of holding our children together, vacations that we've went on, Israel trips, everything that we've ever done and the voice going through your head, it's all coming to an end. And I just bawled. You wanna know why? Because I love this girl. She is a gift to me from God. Do I feel that every single day? Yes. No, some days she's kind of hard to live with. But I take sol solace in the fact that some days I'm hard to live with, right? And we work it out. But I remember just hearing that, and finally I fell asleep that night. An hour and a half, two hours later, I woke up, and I had that still small voice that voice that you just know is God. And I just heard God speak to my heart and say, I've got a lot more work for you and Rochelle to do together. And as we walked that journey, had the operation, took care of all that, I just walked in with confidence, not in anything other than God. Confidence in God and confidence in God's word. I'm glad to tell you that today Rochelle is completely uh, cancer-free. And we are thankful and grateful for that. Absolutely. But it has also put us on a journey of going, okay, we need to be more intentional about taking care of our health. We need to eat correctly, exercise a little bit more, uh, more frequently. Uh, we cannot just rely upon, you know, there's a lot of junk out there that you can put into your body. And we have discovered the, the, what sugar does to your body. And I'm not here to tell you I'm an expert on this thing. I'm not. I am here to tell you that sugar is, a, is an addictive thing that I love. Right? And yet, nobody else gets to take care of my health. It's not the doctor's job to take care of my health. And if my health goes to Kapui and I'm the one that put that stuff in my mouth, can I even blame God? I have to look at myself. I am responsible for taking care of this vessel that God gave me. We have to learn to start taking, and if you don't know how to take care, I'd say get on a journey and start to look and say, what do I need to do better? I'm telling you, it stinks. Because there's nothing better I like than a good potato chip with good dip. Uh, I, I, there's nothing I, I did hear this. This is, this doesn't support my, my, my thing here. Uh, but it does, it does kind of uh, talk about health because it's not just about how you eat and how you take care of you, how you do relationships also adds longevity and goodness to your life. How many of you know that? There was a study that was done. John, uh, I can't remember his name, gave us a, this little statement that said, do you know that they did studies and they found that people who eat terrible yet have great relationships live longer than people who uh, eat wonderful and have terrible relationships. In other words, you will live longer if you eat Twinkies with your friends than if you eat broccoli alone. Come on. That's good preaching right there. I wasn't with you on that whole thing of sugar, but I'm on board with you with the Twinkie thing. I hear that coming out of here. We have to own our stuff. Number four, uh, seven, or uh, six is the, that we need to own our emotions. Emotions are always real, and sometimes they're true. How many of you, you have ever had a meltdown? where your emotion, you got really emotional pretty quick. How many of you have ever been embarrassed by how your emotions were shown? I mean, you got angry, mad, you got upset. Do you know that nobody caused that? You are responsible for your own emotions. I'll say it again. Emotions are always real, and sometimes they're true, right? And we're not going to, like, say that emotions aren't. They're part of our makeup. Love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, strength, and mind. The heart is your emotions. Love God with that. Uh, I love the fact that during worship this morning, some of you just let it out. You just went, woo, yeah, I'm in. Uh, and some of you going, that's not me. But you got excited when that deer came under your stand, right? You got excited. 
we have to own our emotions and uh and and that means that uh some of the things that we do to own our emotions is take care of ourselves proactively uh you know i i've noticed that when i'm hungry angry lonely and tired my emotions don't do as well yeah. right I have to take care of myself in those ways, not to be lonely, not to be tired. Uh, how many of you are not yourself when you're tired? How many of you are not yourself when you're hungry? You get really gnarly, right? Take care of yourself in that way. Number seven, uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one other than I want you to say that you have to own your family. <clears throat> it was Mark Twain that said that he spent a good portion of his, uh, of his wealth uh, uncovering his family tree, but a bigger portion of his wealth covering his family tree up, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, here's the deal is that I was born into a family and I could just say, man, I don't want to be part of that family. My family though is what helps define me. And as an adult now, I have uh, I, I get to own my marriage. Uh, my marriage uh, is what I make of my marriage, right? My marriage is what I make of it, and your marriage is what you make of it. If you're if you're sitting there with destination addiction, going, well, this is maybe I married the wrong person. Here's what I believe: if you become the right person, you'll be married to the right person. Yeah, it's in your it's in your core. Some of you don't need a new a, a new mate. You need a new marriage, and that starts with you. It starts with you. As uh, I, I'll tell you this, that we have two kids that are uh, out and out and about, and it's it would be easy for us to just kind of uh, just say, well, they're done. We're empty nesters now. Yeehaw! Truth is, is I value when my kids call me. I value the relationship. We make effort to be together. I just want to say this, that your family is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. It may not always be comfortable in your family, but your family, own that. Own that. And, I, I, and I'll just guarantee you that when we just start to take ownership of that, uh, that there will be good things that come out of that. Uncomfortable? Absolutely. Your family helps you. They know you better than anybody else. Do you know that your family was put in your life to help you grow in your relationship with God? Look at your, look at your neighbor and say, you're putting my life to help me grow. Woo, man. I have one little last video. And then uh, after this little video, this is the importance of family again. Uh, the little kids, they can just say it so well, can't they? Uh, I'd love to watch this little video. You could have dinner with anyone, living or dead. Who would you choose? Carly Minogue. Oh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. Oh, God, I wouldn't have a clue. I oh, know, straight up. Yeah. Paul Hogan. Kim Kardashian. No, no, no. I'd like to have dinner with Justin Bieber. <laughs> what? He's not coming to my house. So, um... <laughs> I'd have Bob Hawke. Dave Hughes. Barry Humphreys. Jimi Hendrix. People who have made a difference in the world, maybe Nelson Mandela at the dinner table. I don't know what he's going to say, I'm scared. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, oh. who would you choose? Probably our whole family, like a whole extended family. Mum and Dad. <sighs> Mum and Dad. Does it have to be a celebrity? Could it be family? We love it. We talk about how school is. We ask Mum and Dad how their day was. Family. Yeah, Mum and Dad. Family. Who would you guys like to have yeah. dinner with? They just want to be with us mm. while they're eating food, which is pretty cool. They see us above everything. I'm gonna get. Yeah. Yeah. Bit, bit of a message in it for me. Yeah. <laughs>
I, I'm going to give this back to Pastor Carl, but honestly, I really want to just pray for favor for us. If we get one thing out of today, please get this. There is no one that we can blame because we have been empowered by God Almighty to be overcomers, to live a life above reproach, to live a life that God wants for our life. No, take ownership. Be that responsible man of God, that responsible woman of God. Live your life with no regrets. Amen. Before we pray, let me, uh, let me just tag what he just said here at the end. The devil would like nothing more than for you to walk out that back door feeling defeated today, saying, well, I've just messed up everything. My family's a mess. My health is a mess. This is a mess. That's a mess. And uh, it goes right back to the thing that he talked about. You have a choice. So if something is a mess, own it, <laughs> and then choose to make a difference. Choose to do, some, do one thing that will make it better, you know? When Greg and Rochelle and I and Margo go out to lunch here in a little, while, a little while, instead of having a Pepsi, I'm either going to have an unsweet tea or water. <laughs> Hello? Whatever, whatever that situation is where you're sitting there thinking, man, I, I'm, I just have totally messed it up. As long as there is still breath in your body, as long as you're still on this side of eternity, you still have an opportunity to change and to make a difference in whatever it is that you feel like you've just totally blown it at. And so I want to pray for you this morning um, that God will encourage you, that you'll not leave feeling defeated, not feeling overwhelmed by your situation, but instead empowered and encouraged. I always tell people the first step to resolving a problem, and I usually am talking about it in regards to an addiction, is identifying the problem. Until you identify the problem, until you identify your enemy, you don't know what it is that you're fighting against. But once you know what it is, that's the first step in knowing how to take the next step, right? If my issue is health, uh, talking about X, Y, Z, probably is not gonna make a big difference in my health. But now that I know that I'm overweight and I eat Snickers bars and Twinkies and you know, whatever. Oh, okay, so now what am I going to do to make a difference? I'm going to send all those Rice Krispie treats back to Rural Compassion. <laughs> <laughs> they are, let me, let me just be funny for a second. Those Rice Krispie treats, chocolate caramel Rice Krispie treats that y'all sent us, there's only 80 calories in one. So I told them you can eat four or five and you're still good. Okay, now let's get, we'll get serious. Let's pray that God will help us to know what the next step is, okay? Lord, I thank you today for your grace and your mercy that you have shown to us. Lord, there is no doubt in my mind that our eyes have been opened to an area of our lives that we need to own, that we need to take ownership of. And Lord, that's the first step, is taking that ownership, acknowledging that there's an issue, that there's a, there's a problem, there's a situation that needs to be addressed. And so, Lord, today I pray, instead of a spirit of overwhelming or a spirit of anxiety or a spirit of failure or a spirit of fear, God, instead, you will allow uh, the spirit of an overcomer to rise up inside of each and every one of us. And, Lord, that we'll walk out of this place today I, with, that, with that situation identified and looking for you to show us what is the next step. We're not looking for the destination we're looking for that next step. And so, Lord, I pray today that you will help us. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed around the room. And you just say, Pastor, I've got a specific issue that I need you to pray for me about. Would you slip up your hand? Let me just pray with you. I'm, I'm, I see you there. While, uh, while we were uh, in the middle of the service, someone sent a prayer request online and says, uh, I'm struggling bad, not being able to sleep, and uh, I, I need God's help. 
And so we're going to pray for them as well as I pray for you. Lord, you see each hand that's gone up around this room. You see each person that's in their homes or in a hospital maybe watching via the Internet today. You know exactly where they are, exactly the, uh, the, the, the circumstances and the situations that they're facing. But God, whatever it is, you are greater than all of those things. And uh, you have better in store for us. And so today, God, we, we lift our hands and say, God, we surrender to your will, to your way. Lord, we take ownership of that situation, and we ask you, God, to lead us and to guide us, to help us to uh, know what to do. What little thing can I do today, God, to make a step toward this being healed, this being restored, this being made right? Lead us and guide us today. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. That's a good word, brother. That's a good word. I took a picture of the, uh, the destination thing, and, uh, and then you went ahead and just preached it for me, so I didn't have to go there. But for just a moment, let me just uh, touch on this. Beware of destination addiction, a preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place, the next job, or the next partner, until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. You need Jesus. This, this is the problem with the church in America. When this isn't, when we don't feel like this is the right place, we pull up roots and we run down the street and we run to the next town instead of dealing with whatever the issue is and, and learning how to grow where God has placed us. And so let me encourage you you are the church. You are life church. And uh, my door is always open. Uh, I may not be able to get like, this, this instant, this moment, but uh, my door is open. Uh, and if you have a concern or an issue with, with the church or what you're feeling or what you're not feeling, please come talk to me. Um, let's, let's work through it because the, the church is only as good as each one of us here are in our relationship with Christ and with each other. It's about relationship. And so I would love to, to chat with you if you, have, if you have a concern. I want to give you an opportunity to give to Greg and Rochelle and their ministry. Um, uh, Rochelle works uh, also with Focus on the Family, right, down in, in their uh, ministries down in Branson. She's writing, has written some curriculum for them that they use in, in uh, various aspects of, of marriage counseling and different things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in a place where you're struggling uh, in your relationship, uh, feel free to reach out to them. And uh, if, if they're not the right connection for you, they will probably know someone who is and who can help you uh, make some adjustments so that your marriage can be all that God intended for it to be. Amen? All right. Lord, thank you for each gift and giver. Bless uh, abundantly. I pray you'll multiply uh, the, the, this offering uh, numerous times over, and Lord, that it will be used, I know it will be, to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. While they're receiving that offering, let me just uh, last a little updates here. Uh, we will be having youth tonight at 6.30. We'll feed the kids tonight and then, and then have our regular youth service, so uh, be a part of that. Um, uh, send your teenagers, love having them, and God's doing some good stuff in there. We're, we're seeing some breakthrough. We're seeing them starting to open up a little bit, and uh, so it's exciting uh, for that. Um, I, as far as uh, another food distribution in June, um, I usually don't hear from the produce company until the first of the month, so just as soon as I hear from them, I will let you know a date on that, and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to that. Um, I think that's, that's all I need to say. Uh, why don't you uh, greet one another before you leave? Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the dry weather. Uh, yeah, yeah sign-ups are out in the foyer for membership and water baptism. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. We will see you Wednesday night at 7. We will be uh, kicking off the wilderness uh, video study on Wednesday night. So be here Wednesday night at 7.